addictive relationships are in one of two directions. The addict needs to be fixed. As an addict, I want something out there. Alcohol, a drug, sugar, caffeine, gambling, smoking, work, exercise. I want something out there to fix the inner emptiness I've got here. And sometimes, I'll settle on a person. I want you to fix the emptiness I've got in here. So that's an addictive relationship for a primary addict. For a compulsive helper, needs to be needed. Needs to be needed. Now that is just as addictive, just as progressive, just as destructive. Compulsive helpers cause a very great deal of damage. Secondly, it's very arrogant to believe that other people needed me to that extent. I remember in my step five I acknowledged that as a GP some of my patients over the years had committed suicide and I felt such a sense of failure as a doctor that I hadn't been able to help them even though those patients had never mentioned to me that they'd felt suicidal, they'd never mentioned to me that they were depressed. I had no idea, it was a complete surprise. But even then I felt that I had let them down by not providing an environment in which they felt that they could talk to me and all the rest of it. And the man who was hearing my step five said, Robert, you are arrogant. You are incredibly arrogant. Do you really believe that you were responsible for that person's suicide and the others? Do you really believe that you have such power over their lives that something you did or didn't do would cause them to commit suicide? You see, I really had to be confronted with the arrogance of my belief that I could have done something. I did the best I could anyway. But I'm not God. I am not God. I cannot prevent someone else from doing what that person's going to do. I can't stop that. All I can do is what I can do. But a compulsive helper believes that he or she can do everything. And we need to be needed. So the drugs or addictive processes of an addict are blame and self-pity. We blame everybody. And we're so sad about ourselves. We, you know, we're full of self-pity. It, it's not clever. So blame and self-pity are the drugs, if you like, of an addict. For the compulsive helper, it's caretaking. That's not caring, it's way beyond that. It's becoming somebody's caretaker. You do everything for that person. Or oh, just in case something terrible might happen. You know, it's, it's fear-driven. Caretaking and self-denial. It's the belief that it doesn't matter how much it costs me. I'm there. I'm going to be the one person in his or her whole life who was really there and stood up and was counted. I deserve a medal. Or at least I deserve to go to heaven. And so the arrogance of that is absolutely appalling. So compulsive helping is just as destructive as primary addiction. It's just as soul-destroying. It is just as, as addictive. It's just as progressive and destructive. So addictive relationships can be very damaging when you get an addict and a compulsive helper. You rarely get two addicts together. It does happen, but they tend to get fed up with each other because there's no compulsive helper to bail them out. <laughs> so by and large, addicts will tend to make relationships with compulsive helpers. And that's why we spend as much time as we do on our family program to try to help 
um, people to um, heal the entire family rather than just one half of it. There are ways in which we can learn to communicate with each other and it's really quite tricky. Let me show you here. I'll do it on a another sheet of paper. Here is me and Meg, my wife. That's me. That's Meg. This is what's called the open door. That's the trap door. And that's the target door. And what we're going to need to put into those boxes are thoughts, feelings, and actions. And we are different. What is the target door towards which Meg most wants me to go? What does she want me to change? My thoughts, my feelings, or my actions? Actions. Actions. She wants me to change my behavior. So the target door for me is actions. What is the open door through which I am accessible? Or is it why we focus so much on this in Promise? It's my feelings. You can approach me through my feelings. I will hear you through my feelings. Meg will say, we're overdrawn. I say, yeah. And she'll say, but the bank manager was on the phone today. And I say, well, I'll tell him to come phone back another day. You see, you can't approach me through reason, through my thoughts. But if she says, but Rob, I'm frightened. <coughs> Bang, she's got me. I will hear her. And that's why we focus so much here on feelings. That we are accessible, ultimately, through our feelings. We try to block them out. We say, you know, it's very unfair if you made her cry. It may be the only way of helping that person to recognize the addiction problems. We are accessible through our feelings. And therefore, by subtraction, our trapdoor is thoughts. Well, of course that's true. I keep myself safe as houses on my thoughts, on the way that I think, on the way that I explain things. I, I can go backwards, I can go sideways, I can go up and down, I can go all over the place. Any addict knows how to use words. We use Tweedledum words. Tweedledum words mean anything we want them to mean. It becomes totally confusing to everybody else. I can change sides in the middle of an argument and Meg will not even notice. I'm skilled. Any addict is. We can run rings around you. Our thoughts are our trapdoor. Now tell me, how do you really define addiction? <laughs> We've got you. You know, we can talk about that for 24 hours without taking breath. We know precisely how to get, you know, run rings around everybody if we stay in our heads. Couple that with a denial, and you've got real problems. We need to get down into the feelings you know, to be able to express what we really feel like. And the only way you can do that is getting into the feelings. As I was saying earlier, you know, don't let us fob you off. Confront us with our behaviour. Give us the facts.